We hope that uh, there's not a quorum problem because I'd have to go back down, but we wanted to get the meeting started. We've not had a meeting for a while, and there are a variety of issues that we have uh, talked about. Uh, hopefully the other uh, committee people will be forthcoming as their uh, uh, schedules allow them. Uh, we tried to set up this agenda for today, uh, addressing what we think is what we've heard and been reading reports was the most important issues for the neighborhood councils, and that was the elections. And so that's uh, what has been put forward for us to address today uh, on the uh, issues that we're going to be dealing with, uh, one through nine, but the first four are the relevant issues to an attempt to get the uh, election process uh, moving forward. And so I call uh, item one. Item number one is a verbal report from the general manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment relative to the status of updating the roster of neighborhood councils on the department's website and the department's email distribution list with current information on neighborhood councils. Okay. And let me just say for those that here, most of you are veterans, but if you have not put in a card, uh, if you would like to speak on an item, uh, please put one in prior to that item. Good evening, um, Mr. Chair. Bong Lan Kim, General Manager, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, is there, before I uh, give you some background, is there anything special that you wanted me to address? There's two things that I'd like you to address as you give us an overview. Yep. Uh, what came out of several of our meetings was uh, the concern by uh, the neighborhood councils as to the updating of the uh, Dunn website and access to uh, updated information regarding contact or email information. So those are two mm -hmm. uh, issues we'd like to uh, address during this meeting, but we'd like an overview uh, of the department at this time. Okay. Um, what we started with um, about two years ago when the city clerk had completed their uh, elections is that was at that time that was the most accurate um, board roster information. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time when we had IT staff, which we currently don't, um, we sent out a, uh, the contact information to each of the board members, and we have a uh, basically a self-updating function. So given the limited number of staff uh, and the difficulty of keeping track of the board members when they have turnover, they don't always notify us about who, who's in and who's out of their board. Um, what ended up happening is some of the board members uh, deleted their contact information. And uh, so we weren't very successful in when we pushed out the responsibility of having board members update their roster information. Uh, uh, quite a number of them actually deleted their contact information because they didn't want to be um, contacted by the public, which was problematic. So after shortly after that, uh, the department. Let me just one question. They they deleted because what the email contact information was on the web page. Yes. Okay. Yes. The information that we got from the city clerk when they finished their 2010 uh, elections is the at that point that was the most accurate. Um, shortly thereafter, the, but the city depart our department experienced a, a drastic reduction. We went through something like a 50 percent uh, plus reduction in staff. And uh, since that time, we haven't had uh, enough staff to focus on making sure that the roster is accurate. Um, I understand that it's very important that uh, not only the city be able to communicate with the neighborhood council board members, but also their neighborhood stakeholders. Um, it is written in the ordinance that uh, the originating ordinance for the neighborhood councils that uh, the city shall, the city should uh, set up email accounts for each of the board members and issue a city, um, a city email address. Um, I remember uh, at one point contacting the city's ITA about that issue, but um, they also have limited resources and they stated at that time that they wouldn't be able to issue the email addresses to the, some 1,800 elected board members. But um, going forward, there are a few things that we're trying to do in the meantime, because I believe that that's really the ultimate solution, is for the city to issue them city-issued email addresses, because then they would have official means of communicating um, from with each other, but also with the public and that they would uh, essentially use that for all official purposes. 
Um, there are some neighborhood councils, for example, who use uh, their own personal email addresses, and that gets to be problematic when, ex for example, that um, PRA requests, Public Records Act requests, are made of board members, then their personal information gets intertwined with public information. So it would be cleanest if the city could issue them um, individual email addresses. Is, is there an issue on other than uh, resources? Is there any limitation on why they could not get email addresses? Uh, no, there isn't any limitation. I mean, you know, everybody pretty much who has access to the Internet and a computer could create their own email address using uh, Google or any of the popular websites. I think the issue would be, you know, whether we would have a policy that would require them to only use that for official neighborhood council business <laughs> as opposed to intermingling it with uh, their personal email address. And this would be for board members or stakeholders? This would be only for board members, and um, there's a, a second tier of board members. Some neighborhood councils have appointed positions, um, they and appointed. they have appointed positions, and then they have, um, in essence, they have secondary people who, if the board member resigns, then they resume the position. But the majority of the board members are uh, elected board member seats. Um, the there's also a uh, ethics requirement that all board members are required to take, and we're uh, completing a, an, an update of that, and that also con uh, contains contact information. So when every neighbor council board member, there's a, a state law that requires them to complete uh, an ethics test every two years. And um, that should be done probably within two to three weeks, and we expect that uh, that will also have uh, a new iteration of ac more uh, accurate and updated uh, board contact information. Okay. I think the biggest problem challenge for us at this point is that about six months ago uh, we lost our only uh, IT staff and so we currently have uh, no IT positions at all in the department. We're reliant on ITA. They're able to assist us on a, um, on a, a request basis only and uh, so we don't currently have the capacity to develop any kind of electronic platform that would allow us to system more systematically uh, provide that kind of um, contact database for all the board members. Right. Let me just ask, on the issue of uh, uh, the website, is that currently updated or we're, what's the status of that? Um, well, that is also linked with the loss of our IT uh, staff person. So we are um, kind of making interim solutions with some uh, off-the-shelf products, but because we're not uh, we're not really co connected into the city's IT infrastructure, so um, that again would be something that we could address once we were able to refill the um, the current vacancy for the uh, IT. What the vacancy you refer to is that uh, on the managed hiring, or has it been cut, or where is it? It was recently approved through the managed hiring process, and we sent out. Uh, uh, transfer requests about uh, two weeks ago. Okay. And then uh, what, what's been the complaint about the website? Is there information that the board relies on? What, what is it that, that's been deficient? Um, probably the most uh, frequently used uh, information on our website would be the uh, funding information. So what we do on our website, there's a section for uh, the funding program. All uh, city-issued checks and purchase card transactions um, are contained on there. Um, what we experienced with the loss of our IT position was inability to keep that updated. We were updating that uh, at least once monthly. Um, so that is, you, it, that is what treasurers and, and the public can use to track where neighborhood council funds are being spent. But uh, we recently made uh, some quick fixes and, and now the funding information is current. But for the past two months or so, it wasn't. But now, when you say the funding, is that um, funds that are allocated or funds that are uh, basically allotted in the budget, or, or is it a running tally of expenditures? It's simply a, a running tally with a, a remaining balance figure and a starting figure. So it's their, uh, their re it's their, it gives their current year's allocation of 40500 it lists all of the city-issued checks 
that have been approved and paid. It also has a separate tab that shows all of the purchase card transactions. Um, and it also shows, we updated it recently to show the remaining balance because as we start getting to the year end closing, it's very important that all the neighborhood councils uh, be, be able to see what uh, remains of their funds. Is, the, is there currently a backlog on uh, numbers or, or on uh, allocations now? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Or is there a current back backlog on approving allocations now? Uh, in terms of approving payments? Payment. Uh, we're pretty current. We're averaging about a two-week turnaround time. The issue there, uh, though, is that um, we currently have about a 50 percent uh, incorrect, in, a 50 percent error rate in terms of the uh, demand warrants that come to our office. So that means that 50 percent of the demand warrants coming into our office are incorrectly filled out. So um, if there's any delay, that's really where the majority of the delays uh, are occurring because they'll sometimes they won't have the right information that we need in order to, for the controller to approve cutting the check. Okay. Now, this is the uh, demand warrants are uh, basically a request to allocate their funds? A demand warrant is a request to uh, make a payment. They've, so they've, what, on the demand warrant, they send you the, with that the invoice? Yes, correct. They, we have a demand warrant form that has to be submitted by every neighborhood council that shows uh, invoices, copies of invoices. It also has things like the BTRC or vendor information that the city all, we always needs to make sure that we cut when we cut checks. Okay, and then what, how does that differ from the, uh, what do you call it, the purchase card? The purchase card, uh, every neighborhood council is issued a uh, purchase card, uh, usually to the treasurer, and they can spend those for uh, more of the miscellaneous expenses, uh, ongoing expenses, uh, office administrative support type, and they are allowed to, uh, for each transaction, the maximum is 2500 and they can spend roughly half on the purchase card and half um, through the conventional demand warrant system. Okay, but one, but the card, uh, they fill it up with a $2,500 uh, purchase or a, a group of purchases? Um, the 2500 is roughly split into um, four quarters. So that's the $2,500 figure is per transaction. And then what we do is also establish a quarterly limit that is roughly half of their annual allocation. So. Um, in past years, there have been um, complaints that we haven't been able to process the demand warrants quickly enough. So one of the ways that we uh, that I took to kind of relieve the pressure on the demand warrants is to increase their uh, allowable limits on the uh, purchase card. But the purchase card is um, there's some exposure there because we only have the ability to confirm that those are all. Uh, uh, kind of following city policies after the fact because they have to submit quarterly uh, reconciliation reports to the department. And that's what we use to uh, make sure that neighbor councils are using public funds according to all the legal requirements we have for them. The demand warrants are the best in terms of transparency uh, because we have to approve those up front. Okay. And so on the uh, issue of the purchase card, they use it, and then every quarter they submit the documentation to support it. Correct. Let me ask you, on the two things that uh, seem to be of most interest was the email list and the uh, uh, web page. What, what is it in the sense of timing that could get both of those updated uh, for their usage for the neighborhood councils? Well, the funding information is currently updated. It wasn't it wasn't that way about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. but we're able to do that every um, every two weeks is when we update all of the financial transactions. Um, in terms, that include those that you say 50 percent error rate. So, is there 50 percent of them in limbo somewhere waiting to be corrected? Yeah, those aren't and they, those don't show up on our website. Those are more manually tracked inside the department. All, all the only data that shows are approved payments, either through the demand warrant or through the purchase cards. Okay, but if the demand warrant is filled out improperly, right. it goes back for them to Correct. Uh, basically uh, do it correctly. That's right. We either return it or if there's some minor uh, adjustments that can be made, then we'll make phone calls and then we'll make some quick uh, updates and make sure that it can go through the system. 
Okay, so if, if it's in limbo waiting for that correction, then the information that's on the web page is only the approved allocations or, or invoices. That's correct, yes. Okay. And so is, what is the potential of them uh, while correcting one, overspending with another, or is the balance is that close? Well, the uh, ordinance governing the f uh, neighborhood council funding program also states that neighborhood councils are responsible for tracking their own financials. Mm -hmm. So they should be tracking all of the, even though the, the uh, payments don't show up on our website, they should be tracking what their uh, outstanding payables are so that they're monitoring and making sure that they don't overspend. What we're do starting to do as we start approaching year-end closing is sending them um, financial information that shows all of the that shows all of the payments that have been made, and we're also including information in terms of what they have uh, due, basically accounts payable, and then showing them what their remaining balance is. So if they have any discrepancy with the information that we're providing them, then they have to get back to us. Um, What's the lag time of correcting the warrant? It, it varies widely. Um, there are some when we can't make uh, kind of uh, on the spot. If we feel like the, the demand warrant is deficient in some minor ways, uh, the turnaround time could be a matter of a week or two. But if the demand warrant is, is very deficient in terms of the information that we require, then we'll just send it back to them and have them uh, fill out the paperwork more accurately. Is that a, a citywide? issue of 50 percent or is it more relegated to certain neighborhood councils versus others? I haven't really said, we don't disaggregate the data by neighborhood council or by region, that's just a very gross uh, percentage across the board. Um, keep in mind that uh, roughly 50 percent of the um, neighborhood council treasurers don't have much in the way of bookkeeping or financial background. So it's uh, more common than not that volunteers, and it's a lot of work to be a neighborhood council treasurer, so it's very hard to find people who are willing to do that kind of work. So um, we have to be sure that they're getting updated information and they're getting trained uh, as frequently as possible. What we're also trying to do is make the demand warrant as uh, simple to fill out as possible, but there is certain information that's required if, if the controller is going to uh, approve cutting the check. And then on the uh, purchase card, how are they dealt with if, they're, uh, if they don't present the proper uh, documentation uh, when they exhaust the amount of the card? Um, you mean on their quarterly reports when they submit them? Then we will uh, freeze their funds until they submit uh, all of the proper documentation. But um, we have been behind because of the, uh, the, the cuts to our staffing on the accounting side that we haven't been able to keep up on the quarterly uh, reports reconciliation. So um, that's something that I'm hoping to bring on some temporary staffing to help correct before we reach year end. Now, in the sense of funding, uh, where is the largest percentage of funding through demand warrants or through the purchase card? It's roughly roughly half and half. Um, there are there's a wide range of kind of spending patterns of neighborhood councils. You know, so for some example, it, you know, as as we reach, start reaching the year end, um, you know, most neighborhood councils should have expended most of their funds. But as I look at the remaining balances, there are some neighborhood councils that have a substantial amount that have been unspent. And we've been sending them notices on a regular basis to make sure that you're spending your funds on a, on a regular periodic basis so that you don't end up at the end of the fiscal year having to try to spend as much money as possible. That's not the best way to spend public funds, but we do have some neighborhood councils that are um, that have some outstanding balances. I'm concerned that they're going to come to us with uh, some requests for making some allowances, but there's only so much we can do. You know, one thing, uh, and we're going to deal with, uh, uh, as our second priority is dealing with the finances, but what I'd like to ask you to do uh, between now and the next meeting, if you could uh, get with ITA and find out what are the limitations or what are the uh, 
the ways that we can move forward if, if the best solution is to get each board member a city email? What's the, uh, the timeline? What's the lag time? What does it take to get that done? Mm -hmm. And then also uh, uh, looking at the web page that we look at, uh, are there features on it that we need to continue to update and make sure that it's a tool that uh, each and every neighborhood council can access. And, and the other thing I was going to ask is that most neighborhood councils, I guess, have their own web page? About 70 percent do. Okay, now, are they in any way tied to the Dunn web, web page? Uh, they are not. So they're separate and independent. Correct. Now, are there replications on their web pages as to information that you provide? Are they linked in any way? No, currently there isn't. But that would be that would be an advantage for the city as well as neighborhood councils to be tied in some way. That's something I could talk to ITA about. You could well. ask them about that in the sense yeah. of where each neighborhood council that has their own web page, if it's linked to the Dunn web page, uh, so that we can see how we can provide at least in those two areas a more updated web page and access to material, and then also the emails. Uh, and again, I agree that the uh, it is important that there be a city email uh, so that people's private emails are not used for this function nor is it tied up into any legal activity. Okay. So we're going to ask you to do that and, and we'll hold this item until next meeting. Okay, thank you. I would welcome the request to, for the uh, this committee to help uh, work out these IT, um, IT issues with ITA. If you let our office know, uh, Lorenzo's my staff on this and we'd be glad to see what we can do. There. And then we ask the CLA to also whatever we can do to assist. If, uh, let me ask uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Joan Garb on item one before we. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you something. Well, Mr. Parks, I was delayed due to the council I meeting escaped. ending late. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think Joanne Yvanna Garb, West Hills Neighborhood Council. I think part of the problem is that it, it's, just, it's symbolic of the whole system that every department has maybe two or three different platforms that they're running on that it's, it's not consistent. So the city does not have a consistency on uh, the systems that they're using. I know in West Hills, we have our own website page and we also have a Facebook account so that everybody knows what's going on and we have um, constant contact. I gave you a card that has that was the email address that was issued to me four and a half years ago when I uh, became a board member that um, was issued through uh, the Dunn Department. Uh, in addition to that, I pretty much only use my Google account and I set up a specific Google account for West Hills Neighborhood Council. So I have joanne.whnc at gmail.com. So um, that's the email address that I give and I use and all my email comes forward to me. Um, as far as like the P cards, I'll give you an example. Our lovely green bags that we give out at all of our festivals and everything, that's one of our expenses that we use the P card for. So um, it, by paying it with the P card, we get a discount for paying it up front. And that's pretty important to us. So um, uh, there, are, there are a lot of things that can be done. And I think consistency would be the major issue to be addressed throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask, uh, on, on your, you, oh, let me, sorry, before you go, on the email you were given, uh, it actually has the West Hills uh, Neighborhood Council. Is that the kind of email that we would be looking for in the future? Is it a city email or is that something that was unique at the time? Are we looking at an email that identifies lacity.org or I would imagine, though, although ITA would be the expert in that matter. Okay. You imagine what, that we'd have the LA City? or That, that it would be something akin to LA City if it were a city-issued yeah. email. But you said that the city issued you this 
That was issued through, yeah, that was the one that was set up for me. Okay. And I think it was set up through Dunn because uh, at the time we didn't have our own um, uh, person who was uh, a website mm -hmm. okay. or you. proficient in that knowledge. All right. Thank you very much. I just have a, a comment on, you mentioned the bags that you pass out. Uh-huh. Uh, we're moving forward on an ordinance regarding bags in supermarkets. No more plastic bags, no more paper bags, you use your bags. And there's certain requirements as the standard of that bag. So when you purchase the next group, you should look at what the standard is, certain weight, et cetera. So what you're giving the folks would fit the city criteria that they're establishing for the bags. Okay. Those recyclable bags that we're using. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the one thing that we do do is the plastic bottom that we, it reinforces the shopping bag as well. So it makes well, it easier. It's got to hold 22 pounds and certain materials that can be and can't be. There's many restrictions. I'm just saying since you're using yeah. city funds for it and we're getting an ordinance in place for that. Right. You should qualify to make sure that whatever you get. I'll give the information to Ron. I can get it for you wholesale, Sobel. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we look forward to that report, verbal report at the next meeting. Thank you. Item, uh, two. Oh. Item number two is a verbal report from the controller relative to the recommendations for improving the accounting practices and reconciliation of the neighbor council budget and purchase card expenditures. Ms. Garb, you had a card in for two also? You had a card in for two also? Well, we, we want you to speak so they can hear what you say and then they could respond if you have a question. Oh, uh oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I understand that uh, Dunn is overwhelmed. And part of the problem is, is that they don't have the staff that is trained mm -hmm. to do the audits and to uh, carry on. I know last year after um, the money was swept from our account, we had a fight for our funds to be returned because, um, uh, and when when they did charge the uh, the payments, they charged it against our next year's budget. Um, the uh, our treasurer is a professional in the field. This is what she does as a living, and uh, she also is a volunteer treasurer for several other organizations. And our books are kept up to date. Very, very, she's very concise. And it's practically, in order to get a payment out of our board, it's like you have to submit your your right arm and your two front teeth. Uh, we're, we're very precise, and we give the information as much as possible. So um, uh, the problem is, is that sometimes it gets so far behind, and things get lost. When they, when um, Mr. Kim was talking about um, things not being properly completed, uh, we've sent in paperwork and we've sent in paperwork and we sent in the same paperwork and sometimes things just get lost or not attached. So that can be a problem. Uh, but um, uh, the biggest thing is having the trained staff in order to facilitate the audits. Thank you. Thank you. We have the uh, controller's office. On item two. Thank you yeah. for having us here today. Thank you. You know, one of the things that we asked you to come because, uh, as we know, you are eventually the last person that basically distributes the funds. And what we understand is that your life gets complicated if they are submitted uh, without the proper information and the workload it creates for you. And so we're going to we're asking if you could give us some insight because that was probably the second most talked about issue in going around to neighborhood councils was their funding, their inability to access it, uh, the lateness of it. And then finally, when they think they are a success, they then get the controllers kicked back. And so we're trying to see how and what needs to be done for the system to work to where, uh, uh, for the amount of money per neighborhood councils, it appears we are using a great deal of resources to uh, oversee it, to 
track it and a variety of things that create uh, a great deal of frustration for the neighborhood councils but certainly we understand there has to be some controls but I want to see if you had some ideas as to how that could be streamlined and where we would have the necessary controls but on the other hand have a more fluid system that is a, indeed a very big question um, Claire Bartels chief deputy controller uh, and I have with me Faith Mock my principal deputy controller who has been working we have been working um, since the 2010 audit that the audit division of the controller's office performed on neighborhood council expenditures we have been working closely through our fiscal operation division with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment to do exactly what you are hoping um, for which is to streamline um, the payment process um, train uh, properly train or educate the uh, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment staff on the ways in which they can do that and to um, still allow for the flexibility of um, making reasonable expenditures by the neighborhood councils we the controller recognizes the uniqueness of neighborhood councils um, while as you say um, they also balancing that with the need to maintain controls um, some of the solutions uh, for the neighborhood council expenditure program are actually in the 2010 audit that are as my understanding still in the process of being implemented um, and specifically some of the key solutions that we would put forth is um, uh, what sounds like a minor um, issue but it's one that the department has been unable to complete as of yet and that is instituting some kind of impressed petty cash account impressed being that a, allocating a certain amount of a small amount a limited amount of funds to enable each neighborhood council the flexibility of making small transactions presently we hear um, uh, complaints from neighborhood council members uh, treasurers and presidents ourselves that say why must me why must we process a demand warrant for a ten dollar reimbursement or a fifty dollar reimbursement some small outlay of cash that indeed costs the city money to process we are not that is a way that is one of the tools that exists to make those payments but it's not the only way and the audit says um, suggests an impress pe petty cash account that, that does burden the department with reconciling the accounts and there are over 90 of them so reconciling them regularly and allocating or um, replenishing the accounts periodically so we we do expect or we do understand that that's a burden on the department um, and in fact the audit also pointed out and I'm here today to reiterate the audit emphasized a reevaluation of the accounting um, a reassessment and perhaps um, uh, reassignment reallocation or increase of the um, accounting staff at Dunn that was pointed out in 2010 and it's my understanding that it's only diminished um, in quantity the accounting resources in the departments so that would be key but focusing on the here and now what we have been doing and what we've been um, what we strongly suggest uh, working with the department um, to do as you probably know that the Charter um, authorizes or in fact entrusts the controller with the responsibility of um, stepping in and aiding a failing um, accounting operation it has in my history here with the city I believe that we have this office has been involved with aiding another department that had a failing system um, it is not to suggest the Charter does not suggest that we um, absorb the operations of that department and in fact um, indeed each department has the f responsibility for managing its own accounting and its own affairs but we are uh, mindful of the fact that we are we need to assist and put them on, put any department that's struggling on the right track with that in mind we have suggested what um, we endearingly call um, a strike team of sorts that we would like to um, utilize in-house resources and um, our accounting resource pool the, the pool of retired employees as available that you uh, the council authorized the controller to um, utilize two years ago we would put together a team of experienced um, people that the we w would go in and under our oversight under our fiscal operations oversight go in and train the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment on the areas where they have the most challenges and weaknesses 
um, and we would suggest, in fact, training more than simply the more than just the uh, accounting staff of the department alone, but also the um, those that interact with the neighborhood councils themselves, whatever classifications they may be. What we have found, sort of. Um, the greatest, the more recent observation that has been confirmed is the communication between um, neighborhood councils, or excuse me, between DUN and neighborhood councils needs to be more effective, definitely streamlined, definitely standardized amongst all the neighborhood councils. So while we have been working to give the department um, as much flexibility as possible and as much um, uh, um, to simplify the process to the greatest degree possible, um, asking for the minimum um, requirements to basically cut a check. Um, we, I lost my train of thought. Um, the communication, there we go, that's ironic, um, that we found that the communication needs to be standardized. And I think BH may have spoken to the um, fact before I came in the room today about their attempt to, or they're in the process of um, coming up with a standardized web-based application for each of the neighborhood councils to manage their budgets. Um, I believe our office is going to be briefed on that later this week and think that's an excellent idea. But we have equipped them with the tools by which they can operate. They now need the um, tools of communication, if you will. We've also offered to come in and um, train neighborhood council treasurers. The controller does convene meetings um, periodically with neighborhood council presidents and treasurers um, to give our assistance directly, but we suggest teaming up with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment and doing actual Saturday trainings as needed periodically, which were also recommended in the audit that the department do. So we're here to help. Um, there is no one quick and easy solution, but we must meet with them. Oh, I, what would you say, BH? Bi-weekly? <laughs> At least um, with uh, all the key members of our staff diligently working to um, assist in any way, shape, and form. So, One thing I was question. wondering in talking to some of the neighborhood council, I was somewhat surprised that they did not have um, necessarily technology to monitor to their own funds. Some of them are still using pen and paper. Uh, and so uh, it seems as though that you're almost destined to fail if you're not monitoring and tracking it at the very local level. And so you're going to end up with uh, uh, a bad product that you're sending forward to either Dunn or whoever and then eventually to the uh, controller. Have we done anything there to look at the minimum amount of electronic monitoring that needs to be done at the uh, neighbor council level? Well, the audit gave that responsibility to the department, indeed, in 2010, to suggest that neighborhood council treasurers be trained and a uh, standardized approach to tracking the expenses at the neighborhood council level be developed. So I believe that is what um, the department is working with ITA to create. Okay. We didn't set forth electronic standardized, standards. standardized, are we talking about technology standardization, or did we go that far? We said standardized, and we were implying um, it could be as simple as a standardized Excel spreadsheet, not a highly complex technological um, platform. The most important part was that everyone have the same fields to fill out and the same manner of reporting, reconciling, submitting, and that it be as um, um, in the real time as possible as email or um, online can be. Now, when you mentioned earlier the, it, the training that you're giving to Dunn staff and commented that the uh, shortage of staff, has there ever been any consideration of, of streamlining to the fact of the controller taking over that process as opposed to having so many steps, as opposed to getting it at the tail end and having to kick back so much of it? Well, as I'm sure you're aware, um, the controller performs uh, certain functions for all city departments, but there has to be a separation of duties and responsibilities that um, are delegated to the department chief accountant depart uh, citywide for every city department. So um, while we, ha we have considered and are in the process of evaluating 
um, or starting the conversations with the CAO um, regarding pooling accounting resources throughout the city. It would not be entertained, and we will consider done amongst those um, departments whose resources could potentially be pooled. So a shared resource type of um, arrangement whereby perhaps small and similar departments accounting resources could be clustered to perform like duties. Um, it would be, I'm describing it that way to distinguish it from a um, consolidation of a single department within the controller's office. Okay. Is that based on what we've heard before about the, uh, the loss of, of uh, uh, expertise in the accounting field? Is that one of the rationales that's driving it? Absolutely. Um, the um, loss of accounting resources throughout the city have only increased the workload for the Office of the Controller in as much as, as you said, it all ends with the controller at some point. And so we are spending a great deal of time assisting many city departments done is certainly um, one at perhaps the top of the list given its um, current resource situation. Okay. And you said that was a 2010 audit of done? Correct. Now, uh, what, what is the current status to your way? To my knowledge, there's still about nine recommendations that are in process of being implemented. Um, and there were over 30 originally. One of the recommendations being the implementation of the petty cash account. Um, another, some of them were um, meant to be efficiency solutions, such as um, the re we found that the quarterly statements weren't being reconciled. Um, in fact, there was a great backlog of um, reconciliation of the statements from the neighborhood councils on their expenditures, P-card expenditures. Um, we had suggested not um, reviewing, doing reviewing by sampling, so similar to how the controller's office demand audit function would occur. Um, so spot checking, essentially. So some of our recommendations were, well, they were all in, in, um, intended to assist the department, but some were more um, added help than others. What was the expectation of these 30 recommendations that they could handle them within their existing resources or was there rec or, or some assessment of need of more personnel? We did recommend that the done staffing level, specifically the accounting staff, be reviewed and reassessed. We did not make a determination of how many were needed or at what level, but it did seem that they were struggling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The um, guidelines, spending responsibly, have we ever established those guidelines? And I know there were some issues with the district attorney and some folks got uh, charged with uh, inappropriate expenditures. Have we ever laid out proper expenditures versus non-approved expenditures and the consequences? Um, the controller has always had the authority to um, approve based on reasonableness, but is there a written definition of reasonableness? No. What, the way um, our judgment, our determination is made um, citywide is based on the policies of the department, the individual department. And in fact, the audit, um, one of the findings of the audit was that um, a mission for the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment ought to be more clearly defined and that acceptable, um, allowable expenses ought to be more um, well defined. So there, there were policy problems. and purpose. There were problems, there were investigations, there were arrests, etc. I would think that by now there'd be guidelines as to what areas are acceptable, what areas are not acceptable versus their own discretion to say, we, we, do we do it and then find out later? In other words, give them a path, some, some guidelines, some boundaries. Well, the audit pointed out, for example, that a great deal of money was spent on expenditure of food, but it certainly didn't judge, make a judgment on whether that was right or wrong because there are no, there were no um, policies precluding 
the amount of money, uh, precluding any given neighborhood council spending any particular amount of money on food or really other activities. I believe um, the neighborhood councils, we believe, would benefit from um, further clarity from the department as to the purpose and mission and what is appropriate. And therefore, if there are guidelines and policies of um, the core mission of the neighborhood councils in place, um, that's what we would expect to judge payments on. All of the payments that w are approved, um, well, I should take a step back. The department as uh, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment is certified like most all neighborhood, excuse me, most all council controlled departments. They approve payments, authorized payments under or up to $100,000. So clearly the realm of the neighborhood council expenditures, the approval level is at the department level. The controller only sees um, direct expenditures over 100000 but the controller does audits to verify that they're within the guidelines. I know that their own guidelines, correct? Okay. And are, to your knowledge, are the guidelines within done to the neighborhood councils as to what would be appropriate and not appropriate expenditures? What we found in 2010 was there weren't sufficient guidelines in place to by which to make that judgment. Do we have those now? To your knowledge? I couldn't answer that because our I don't know. Okay. Because I know that there's a, a current situation with the federal government where there were expenditures for food, and there was a, a big scrutiny on that uh, general services of, of the federal government, um, and they uh, they're now being criticized and questioned on it. It's my understanding, and being a former charter commissioner, helped bring about the charter with the inclusion of neighborhood councils. There was the, the dollars that came into the Honda administration were to be used for community enhancement, community programs not to be used for some of the expenditures that I've seen. So I don't know if there's been any specific guidelines to say this is appropriate, this is inappropriate. Um, it's all taxpayers' money, as we know. And then the issue of the audit was another concern I had on equipment. It seems that there's been a lot of equipment that's been purchased, and then when folks leave the neighborhood council because their terms up, there's no accountability for the equipment. So while, while the issue of expenditures, whether it's 50000 or 40000 or whatever the dollar value is, that's all taxpayers' money that goes for a purpose to benefit that particular community. And I know that there, there's been reduction in personnel in the Department of Labor Empowerment and turnover in personnel, but it doesn't give the uh, ability or the discretion to go outside of what is reasonable. And if we don't establish what is reasonable, then we have those problems that affect the neighborhood council. And then someone comes in with an investigation, public integrity of the district attorney's office, and then people get in trouble. So, I mean, at least we establish guidelines, and if people go outside those guidelines, then they're held accountable and responsible. If we don't establish those guidelines, then we need to address those guidelines and establish those guidelines. Because you're talking about, uh, with the 90 plus neighborhood councils, a lot of dollars. So the accounting practices, uh, reconciliation of budget and purchase card expenditures. I know there's been concern about not getting timely return of the dollar when they expend dollars or some of the credit that's given with the assurance that neighborhood council will receive the money through the controller's office. But it just, it just seems there's still a lot of bumps in the road mm -hmm. that haven't been resolved and they need to get resolved. So the neighbor councils can serve their purpose in the community, benefit the community, and not come into uh, issues that border on uh, indictments and things such as that. I'm concerned when honorable people in the community get involved in something that we did not really help prevent in the first place. So that's all I have for that. Let me ask, when's the last time in this audit of 2010 When's the last time the controller's been updated on the uh, completion or the status? Um, August 2011. And that's when they had nine items still remaining? In progress, yes. August Including the software or the um, yeah. electronic <laughs> accounting. And then uh, as far as the uh, original audit, how did that come to be? Is that just a routine audit or was there a request? Or? Actually, the original, I believe it was a follow-up audit to a 2006 audit performed by the prior controller. And uh, did you, do you recall what the uh, 
progress from 206 versus 210, uh, or were they the same items that were identified? Um, I do not recall the 2006 findings at this moment. There might be a summary in the uh, um, right. 2010 document, and I can certainly leave that with you. But it, I, the neighborhood councils were certainly in a different phase of their evolution in 2006 versus 2010, and there's certainly quite a good um, deal more neighborhood councils. Okay. Let me say thank you very much for the information, and I'd ask that we hold this in committee and that when we get into the finance part of our discussion, that one of the items that we asked to be on the agenda is the 2010 audit. And then, uh, but thank you very much for the information. Thank you. Next, next item. <laughs> item three. Item number three is the city attorney report and ordinance amending the Los Angeles Administrative Code to transfer authority from the city clerk to Dunn on a temporary basis to conduct at neighbor council elections, all neighbor council elections during the 2012 neighbor council election cycle pursuant to council instruction of January 3rd, 2012 and communication from the Board of Neighbor Commissioners relative to an opt-out option for neighbor council elections. Uh, before staff come up, let me uh, call those who have cards in. Roxanne Stern, Ivan Spiegel, just come on up to the mic. Uh, Paul Park, and Constant, is it Boken? Bokens? Okay. I'm Roxanne Stern, Westwood uh, Village Neighborhood, and I'm not on a neighborhood council, but I'm very concerned about our neighborhood council and the way the election was run. Speak into the mic, uh, so our first, pull that up closer. Our first and our first and only so far uh, election was needed needs to be uh, changed. And as much as I would like Dunn to take over, I don't think Dunn has the staff staff to handle it. I would think that's the perfect place for this to rest, but until Dunn is allowed to get a bit bigger staff and, and be more on top of everything. I think it should not uh, be taken, give, taken away from the city clerk. Um, but that would be my main, my main <coughs> a recommendation. And I also believe there should be no opt-outs for elections this year until we, everybody's on the same page and everybody's using the same system, the opting out with it when we don't really know what's, the, what's happening in all the neighborhood councils, that that would not be a good idea at this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is <clears throat> Ivan Spiegel. Um, I'm from the Venice Neighborhood Council. We voted unanimously to go forward with our election this year. We have a very strong um, tradition in Venice of democracy and feel that people have a right to choose their representatives. We started this conversation about the city elections well over a year ago. A year ago, February, the election task force, which was made up of about 25 representatives from different councils, came out with a series of recommendations saying, please let us go forward. So now we're down the road here. And the first elections are tentatively scheduled for the first week in August. There's a 90-day period before that that it takes in order to get it together, you know, get your plans together, start doing outreach for candidates, etc. If this is postponed anymore, it's not going to happen. We're really up against it now because that first group that's supposed to have elections the first weekend in, in August, in two weeks, that's their 90 days. So if it gets pushed back, Everybody is going to get pushed back, different dates. Um, we urge you to go forward with this, um, to get it before the council and get something approved so that we can all move ahead here. We really don't want elections canceled in this city. It's not the democratic thing to do. And I'm sure you realize that, you know, you can't just cancel elections in this country. 
Um, we thank you for your time. And look are you, are you saying to move forward with the clerk or with Dunn? Or does it matter? The, the city clerk has made it very clear that if they were to be uh, to run these elections, they would have had to start this well over a year ago. So they're pretty much out of the ballpark now. If you just want to see the election. We just want to see some elections. Our, our council had a great experience with the city clerk. We would love to have seen them back. The issue was money, and there was no way that the councils could pay for them because they're expensive, and we understand why. Um, so the only thing left for us really is to start is to go back to the old system and to start doing it again. Um, in 2014, if we could figure out some way to fund it, I would love to see the city clerk come back again. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Paul Park. I'm a commissioner on the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners, and I'm here to reiterate some of the points that uh, we sent to you in a letter uh, with respect to this draft ordinance. Um, and we have one particular concern, which is uh, a provision in 22.801.2, uh, subsection C, which gives uh, the uh, um, done the authority uh, and the discretion to hold off on elections on a case-by-case -case basis uh, for neighborhood councils. In talking with the city attorney's office and with Dunn, uh, we found out that that, um, that measure was thought of as a potential cost-saving um, um, option. Uh, and that, you know, that would allow uh, neighborhood councils that want to opt out to save the city some money. Um, uh, under our understanding of how these elections are probably going to be run on a regional basis, we don't see a whole lot of cost savings that could be uh, seen from, from allowing neighborhood councils to opt out. But we do see tons of problems uh, uh, poten uh, potentially there if you allow uh, neighborhood councils to opt out. First of all, we don't think that there's a cost-effective way outside of polling all the stakeholders uh, on which neighborhood councils want to actually opt out, um, and that would be just as expensive as elections. Secondly, we think that if you allow the neighborhood uh, board members, neighborhood council board members for themselves to decide they want to opt out of this and done to grant them, uh, an extension of their term, that that's very undemocratic and that would be disenfranchising uh, the voters within those uh, neighborhood councils and it would also affect the integrity of the entire system because it's just a, a not uniform, unequal way of conducting elections. And so uh, as a policy matter, we would strongly urge you to remove that uh, option from the ordinance. Thank you. Okay, I'm Connie Bokitas. I'm a lifelong Connie, resident Connie, of West. Hold on one minute. Let me get some other people up and then we'll get Okay, started. go ahead. Uh, James Callis, uh, Stephen Resnick, and Sandy Brown. Okay. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Westwood and a board member of the Westwood Neighborhood Council as well as its chair of the Land Use, the Flat Land Use Committee. Let me state that our council has voted several times unanimously in favor of the city clerk retaining control over the neighborhood council elections. It's incredulous to me that neighborhood council elections are even being considered this year given the city's fiscal status. Second, I stand in opposition to the transfer of the control of the neighborhood council elections from the city clerk to Dunn. We just sat through the testimony by its rep as to how it's an eviscerated entity after budget cuts over the last few years. Our council alone sent in bylaw amendments one year ago and have yet to receive an approved version. Transferring power to Dunn just opens up more potential for voter fraud, abuse, and disenfranchisement. The city's obligated to its 93-plus neighborhood councils, especially those that have contentious elections, to ensure fair, transparent, neutral, and uniform elections. Only the city clerk can do this. As far as the Westwood Neighborhood Council is concerned, I understand that just west of us in 2010, the West Side Neighborhood, the West Side Neighborhood Council was given the option to opt out of elections by stipulation until 2014. I understand a few other neighborhood councils are in that situation. How can this be? This whole process appears arbitrary and undemocratic. If the council chooses to pursue elections with Dunn, then the ordinance must contain an opt-out clause that can be triggered by the, a noticed hearing by the board with a quorum where a simple majority carries the day to invoke the opt-out clause. Dunn should not have discretion to intervene over 
this individual neighborhood council's decision. Um, I think that it's best to wait till the city is more fiscally uh, in, better, in a better situation to hold neighborhood council elections. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Stephen Resnick, I'm the secretary of the Westwood Neighborhood Council. And uh, uh, once, once again, uh, uh, our uh, council has uh, discussed this uh, uh, thoroughly, and we are in favor of an election conducted only by the city clerk. We feel that's the only way uh, uh, to have a fair and uh, balanced error-free election, uh, especially considering the state of the affairs uh, with uh, with uh, the, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. And if that cannot we, be done, we are strongly, uh, unanimously in favor of an opt-out provision and for us to opt out until 2014. With the uh, Neighborhood Council election survey, when we discussed it at our January meeting, we unanimously voted to have an election only conducted by the city clerk. And we also, uh, unanimously voted to postpone any election until 2014, and we don't have a second choice. There was, there was no discussion about that. And further, in our March uh, uh, board meeting, we passed uh, uh, unanimously the motion that we do not support the, the uh, Neighborhood Council's election task force's eight points and recommends that the Western uh, Regional Alliance of Councils, RAC, take the same position. So it's an unfortunate situation, but we feel there's, uh, there's no choice uh, to conduct a proper election. It's either the city clerk or, as the exception has already been given uh, to the West Los Angeles Neighborhood Council and others, we ask that, that uh, our election be postponed until 2014. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, Sandy, I Thank you. I'm Sandy Brown, and I'm president of Homey Westwood Property Owners Association. Uh, 1,100 single-family homes of stakeholders in Westwood, in the Westwood Neighborhood Council area. When we got the um, original summary of the draft ordinance, it sounded very promising in that it said that it allows the department the authority for those neighborhood councils that desire to hop, opt out of an election and extend the current board members' terms to 2014. However, if you look at the actual writing of the ordinance itself, it gives the department it's in its discretion may direct. So we don't have any hope but that if this ever went before bonk or done, that we would not be able to opt out. The interesting thing is, is that there are four neighborhood councils in the city who have already opted out, and those include West LA Neighborhood Council, Chatsworth, Porter Ranch, and Can Do. So this has already been done um, for some neighborhood councils. Um, part of the problem is that it's an arbitrary and capricious way in which Dunn would be able to say you could opt out or you couldn't. There is no criteria for this, yet some have already opted out. One of our big issues is that we are not even in, an, as a neighborhood council, we aren't even there for two years yet and won't be until November. So our stakeholders and the board members have really barely begun. Our website is, is finally up and working, but we're just, we're not there yet, and to make us have a whole new election makes absolutely no sense at all for the community. So I would ask that um, that you at least look at our situation. It's a very special situation. We are brand new, and we would ask you for um, the 2014 um, election for us. Thank you. What number are you on, Neighbor Council? What number? Oh, 88 or 90 or, or 91. 91. I mean, we're way up there. 92. We like were 91, one of the last. It's only the Palatine. You're not the last, though. Uh, no, there's been I'm one. Second to last, I think there's perhaps. been one or two since then. Uh, Could be second to last. Right. BK, how many do we have now? About 93, I think. 95. 95. Okay. You're all wrong. There's 95. Right. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Jim Callis. I'm the Ar uh, senior representative from the Arlita Neighborhood Council. The Arlita Neighborhood Council is in the preparation of preparing for an election also. But I have a question concerning what we're doing in Arlita. Uh, our board members have already been termed out. We were termed out on 27 March uh, 2012. So my question is, can the Arlita Neighborhood Council conduct general and committee meetings tonight legally so that we can prepare for an election? Now, I've sent a couple of emails to uh, 
the city attorney, Darren Martinez. I got an immediate response on two, and the one that I asked the same question, I'm still waiting for a response. It's my opinion that once we're termed out, legally, unless somebody can give me something in writing that authorizes us to continue, we can't continue. And I'd like to get an answer to that. And since there are at least six other neighborhood councils in the valley in our region that all have the same problem, why didn't the commission done or this committee address this issue long before now? And in regard to the draft ordinance that I have right in front of me, in section 22801.2, neighborhood council elections administered by the department, section C, lines three through six should be redrafted into plain language so we can all understand it. I called the legislative analysts for CD6 this morning and asked them to explain the writing of that in this draft ordinance that's before you, and I wasn't able to get a clear answer on that either. So thank you very much. Before we get to that, could we have the city attorney just respond? I think there was some accommodations for allowing termed out individuals to be reappointed. That's correct. If there is a term, the board members are still allowed to continue and serve. Presumably, if this ordinance was adopted, the department would also adopt regulations that by policy would state that to the same effect. When the department does create that policy, then the writing that Mr. Callis was requesting would exist. Thank you. Next two speakers, Ms. Garb and also Sarah Mallory. It's Joanne Yovanik Garb, West Hills Neighborhood Council. The 2010 elections for us was a debacle. We had 70 people who were turned away because they could not prove that they lived in West Hills, but yet our bylaws said live, work, worship, et cetera. And so they were coming in, and they were literally, we had 70 people who were disenfranchised from voting in our neighborhood council elections. And that's a problem that we wanted to address. Secondly, coming into August, beginning in August, I see it as a problem that there are so many people who are going to be on vacation, and school starts, this is the last hurrah before school starts for many parents because now LAUSD is going to be starting in August. So there's going to be a lot of people on vacation, and we're scheduled to have our elections between August 13th and 19th. I know I'm going to be out of town, so I won't even be able to attend my own election, and I'm up for re-election. So that's a little problematic for me. As far as us handling our own elections, we handled it very successfully in the past. As Gracie was part of our team, that we had put together the SVEA, which was the South Valley Election Authority or Administration, and we monitored, we had an independent monitor come in and do our elections, and we ran it quite successfully. So that's something that can be put together again, that people who get together, and we discussed our elections and what we were going to do ahead of time as well as afterwards. We had a lot of discussion about how we could make it better. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Sarah Mallory, and I'm with Council Member Paul Koretz's office. Council Member Koretz wanted to come today, but unfortunately he has another meeting, so he wanted to say that he appreciates the work that's been done so far from the City Clerk's Office, City Attorney's Office, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, and all the neighborhood councils around the city who have done so much to this point. As a general matter, Council Member Koretz thinks that the neighborhood councils themselves 
should be responsible for their own elections this is both the most cost efficient and the most democratic process for realizing the grassroots vision of neighborhood councils as the first line of local government for this election cycle which is an anomaly year obviously council member Kretz supports Dunn's proposal for the 2012 elections with one exception council member Kretz strongly supports giving neighborhood councils an opt-out right as proposed by the draft ordinance from the city attorney's office again the council member thinks that neighborhood councils themselves should make these decisions almost half the neighborhood councils who responded to the city clerk's elections surveys so that they could be supportive of delaying all elections until 2014 the Valley Alliance of neighborhood councils has urged the council to include an opt-out provision <coughs> several neighborhood several neighborhood councils in the fifth district themselves including Westwood who you've heard from today many active and concerned community members as well as the West Side neighborhood councils have expressed good policy reasons for their support of an opt-out provision we also urge the council to ad adopt an opt-out provision that is simple and clear if a neighborhood council the appropriate action by its boards petitions to opt out that request should be granted there should be no additional criteria which would make it difficult for neighborhood councils to make an opt-out choice Thank let you. me just ask a question on the opt-out sure. uh, how do you address the issue where those in the the neighbor council who believe they've been disenfranchised because they have not had an election how do you resolve that issue sure within our council district we've heard many who have wanted the opt-out option as their that's what they want um, especially for me I'm the Westwood field deputy so as you heard today a new council that's coming up um, I understand that there are concern on the other side for dis like being disenfranchised however the concerns are very great in the other way as well we want to uh, allow those who have unique circumstances such as the Westwood or the West side to be able to ha be represented as well Okay. And, and how do you reconcile as a group of 95 organizations that they have some consistency and standardization of elections sure um, I mean that's obviously a concern uh, and that's what we're saying that provision should be simple and clear and granted for those who are wanted but overall uh, up to 50 percent that they say that they would want to have the elections delayed until 2014 so it's a high percentage of people who are extremely concerned and would like this opt-out provision mm -hmm. nonetheless okay. No. Okay, thank you thank you okay. let me just start a discussion on the ordinance and so that this uh, based on a couple of comments people made about um, the uh, city clerk versus done I think in the reading of the ordinance it reflects that this is a one-time situation because of the delay and also we should be aware that done, that uh, the city clerk is going to be pretty involved very shortly in the 2012 uh, general elections and so it's very difficult for them to take on this responsibility but that's why the ordinance talks about having done take it over for this year and so although there may be some financial uh, cost on the other hand is primarily a workload uh, as it relates to their issues uh, and looking at uh, uh, this ordinance and I think Mr. Uh, let's see, Mr. Callis you commented about uh, whether you had authority to continue to work I think if you go to page 2 subsection th uh, C you'll see the language there that addresses I think your concerns uh, as it relates to uh, extension of terms and so the one thing and and and, and uh, I'll just throw out my view and trying to listen uh, to a number of people on this uh, one of the issues I think we the reason that we're kind of in the fix that we're in is that everybody I think has an opinion about their neighborhood council as opposed to a viewing how do we get 95 neighborhood councils on the road to uh, elections and how do we come up with a system that ensures that elections go on every two years uh, in my judgment if you have a opt-out clause uh, you may never get to that point and it becomes even more costly as we come up with not only uh, non-standard elections <laughs> ongoing but then non-standard election times and so again what we're talking about is a situ situation that there's little likelihood uh, that there's going to be more resources or money coming to done for elections and so uh, we can uh, basically uh, uh, 
continue to look at this and do nothing uh, and, and then have uh, neighbor councils move forward on their own and do their own elections uh, outside the process or we could try to figure out a system in which we begin to get all the neighborhood councils on uh, some steady ground and begin to look towards the future. And so that's something I think that's important uh, as we listen to the ne number of meetings that we had. Uh, I know that everybody has their own parochial view about their neighborhood council, but I think from my particular standpoint, I'm trying to figure out how do we get 95 neighborhood councils functioning in the city and at the minimum cost and with the ability to say that we are back in cycle as relates to the, uh, uh, the uh, particular ordinance. And so in my judgment, particularly in light of uh, giving neighbor councils the ability to elect or select, it would appear that that is more than sufficient discretion on how they can address their issues versus opting out. And so if they feel as though uh, they don't want to go through the anonymous elections and they believe that the people that are in office are appropriate, it would appear they could take advantage of the select criteria and select those that are already in play. And so that's uh, my concerns about as we look at this ordinance. That's fine. Okay. So the issue is, uh, again, uh, although I, I know that many people came today and said there are no options, uh, what my goal is, uh, is trying to get elections done through 2012 uh, to then uh, uh, allow a neighborhood councils to either elect or select. Uh, but again, I would ask that on, the, on this ordinance that we not uh, have a formal opt-out clause, that we allow, we direct people to two different standards, and if they choose to select people for another two years, it should be a process that allows that selection to go forward. And if they wish to elect them, uh, they would also uh, move forward in that regard. And so that would be my only concern on the pending ordinance. But I think also as we move to item four, which is the, uh, um, the survey, there's some other issues I'd like to bring up when we deal with that. On the item, the city attorney, is there any issue that would cause a legal Regarding what uh, Chairman Parks just mentioned. Uh, yes, Le De Deputy City Attorney Darren Martinez. Just one, one brief comment. Uh, when drafting this ordinance, we were attempting to provide the department with as much um, tools as it, as it could use. While we're using this term opt out, you obviously may recognize that's not the term that's used in the ordinance. It's really one that's providing the department with the discretion to extend some board member terms, whether that be to this year, 2012, or to 2014. Admittedly, when drafting this, that concept of opting out was something that was in the discussions where that existed among city council, among out in the community. So that was an idea that was previously discussed, and that was a language that was included in here. However, it's not mandatory, this language. It's entirely within the department's discretion and entirely within the department's discretion to establish the parameters within which it could occur. So certainly council could instruct the department that, you know, that it's not to, uh, that, that this, uh, that this uh, extension of terms to 2014 should only be used in the most rare of circumstances and the desires to have all neighborhood councils conduct their elections in 2012. And let me give you an example of why I think that the language may still prove useful in, in the ordinance, and that is we have neighborhood councils that maybe were just certified six months ago. And so it somewhat makes it difficult to have them come up for elections as well. And, and there may be a situation that in the department's discretion that it determines is suitable that a, a board in a unique or rare situation should have their board member term extended to 2014 without necessarily removing that tool from the arsenal that the department has in conducting the elections. Let me just comment on that. I think what we've heard over and over is that, number one, that Dunn doesn't have the staff nor are neighbor councils interested in them imposing their discretion on the local council. And it would appear to me that if a neighbor council uh, is in a position to select or elect, they're in a better position to determine whether these people should continue on or have an election or a selection that moves them forward. It appears also inconsistent with neighborhood councils that done is making that decision for them and saying, I'm going to hold your 
current officers in place on my discretion. Well, yes, the ordinance does not impact in any way the neighborhood council's ability to have a selection process. It does if you give the option in saying there's language that allows them to have some discretion when it appears that discretion should be at the lowest and local level. Correct. And, you know, we would accordingly draft the ordinance at, you know, at the direction we receive. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of guidance, and we were trying to provide the tools at that point in time. Was there any discussion about when you say new neighbor councils, that if their terms have not expired, that they may be exempt? Well, in trying to create the ordinance, we try to anticipate possible problems that may come up, so we try to include language in there that would resolve potential problems. I wish I could be six months into the future and look back and write this again and see what problems that I wish I had addressed in this ordinance. So, you know, in some sense, you're trying to accomplish the best you can while drafting it. Was that discussed at all? Not that I necessarily remember specifically. I have a personnel committee meeting that I have to leave for, so I think you're on that committee also? No, no. I'm on a reduced workload. Okay. I need to go to a – so excuse me. Are there any consent items you have on the agenda? Yeah, let me go while you're here. So I could do that so we could have the vote. Five, six, seven, and eight should be consent. Do you have speaker's cards in this, Mr. Chair? Five, six, seven, and eight. Do you have speaker's cards, I believe, on seven and nine? Okay. Let me quick – okay. We have – or let's go item five as a consent item, and basically it appears to be dated in the fact that this refers to the 11-12 budget, which the date is passed. Item six, a consent item. If we can quickly have Ms. Stern come up and make her comments, and then we can get Mr. Zines' vote before he has to leave. Well, I think that this relates to the opt-out again, and I just want to point out that using Westwood Neighborhood Council as an example had its first and only election, and I'm not even sure – I don't feel that the election was a fair election, but that's neither here nor there. Since that election, at least four members have resigned, and four members, I think, have been appointed. So if we go like this, in the end of next year, we could have a completely unelected neighborhood council, and I think that's really important that we take that opt-out away from the situation, because they did not – they would not be representing the neighborhood because they were not elected. I realize number six deals with a time specific with the 11-12 budget, and they have a date of May 18th. I misunderstood. Okay. Okay. Never mind. But I still – I still stand. We'll move that item six with a – on receive and file. That is the dated item. Item seven, Ms. Mallory, and also Ms. Stern on item seven. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Sarah Mallory with Council Member Paul Koretz's office, and on item seven, I just wanted to say that all the – we understand the committee is likely to receive and file item seven. We also want to urge the city clerk, Dunn, and the neighborhood councils themselves to continue looking at additional election processes, which could improve participation, including Internet voting. We understand that these election pilots may not be used in this election cycle. It's an anomaly year again and a short time period. But we hope that there will be continual review of such new technologies going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. – Roxanne Stern again, and this is regarding the – excuse me – the authorizing of perhaps a pilot program. And I think that idea is good, but let us not do that for another two years. Let's make sure that all the neighborhood councils are on the same path as far as running an election, and then they can start experimenting. But if we have neighborhood councils going off, when we really don't know what works now for everybody, it would seem like it's really a little bit too early to consider that. Okay. Thank you. On item seven, we'll move receive and file, and we will address the future alternative methods when we deal with number four. Ms. Mallory, on your concern about looking in the future, 
uh, for alternative election methods, we'll add that to number four. Okay, but we'll move that one. Number eight, uh, there are no cards. Uh, we'll move that one, receive and file. And this deals with the 2000 election, so it's dated. And, uh, it's 20, 2010 elections of the 2010. 2010. And then number nine, uh, we have one card, Ms. Stern. And also realize this motion is dated also. So it's so what, anything about the future is, is not relevant. Well, it's, it basically refers to March 2nd, 2010 election. Well, what happened was in, in the last election in 2010, 2011, that there was a vote by mail issued by the city clerk. And there were two only two ways one could apply for a vote by mail, religious reasons or physical <coughs> reasons. And it turns out that there were 300 people who suddenly got religion and were infirmed and couldn't make it. So it was there was real voter fraud as far as using the uh, vote by mail. And I don't know how one could uh, get around that, but it was um, it was really very, very wrong. Okay. So we have that <coughs> item as also being dated referring to 2010 elections. But in that last phrase about subsequent elections, we'll move that item to number four. So when we ask for a continued looking at a survey for alternatives, we'll include a vote by mail. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Kirk. Right. Stephen Pyle. Stephen Pyle. Thank you, sir. So that's items five through nine. Nine. Okay, so what do we have left? Four? Four. Mr. Chair, before you move on from item three, what was your final action? Item three. Uh, basically, oh, this is uh, the ordinance. Yeah. We approve the ordinance, uh, but uh, ask that uh, it be amended to remove the opt out. Thank you. Uh, and that we uh, support the uh, selection or election phases of the ordinance. Thank you. Okay. Item four. Item four is the city clerk, city clerk report on the neighbor council election alternative survey conducted in response to the council's instruction for the city clerk to review alternatives for conducting neighbor council elections pursuant to adoption of the mayor's 2011-12 budget on May 18, 2011. Good afternoon, Mr. Park. Perhaps it would be helpful if I... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> If I uh, just quickly summarize how this survey came into being. Um, in the fiscal year 2011-12 budget, uh, no funds were provided in that budget for the city clerk to administer elections, which normally would have been taking place in March through June of this year. However, the council instructed that the clerk review and make recommendations to this committee regarding alternatives to conducting neighborhood um, elections. To comply with this directive, the city clerk conducted and on February 1st of this year completed the neighborhood council election alternative survey, asking neighborhood councils directly how they preferred their elections to be conducted. And uh, I think what's important to emphasize is the fact that this is the very, very first time um, this survey is the absolute first of its kind in terms of asking neighborhood councils directly how they preferred their elections to be conducted. And it was constructed in such a way that each neighborhood council board needed to take the question directly as an official um, board action and vote upon it and then return its uh, recommendation back to the clerk. Um, I would like now, having introduced why the survey came into being, um, my election staff, Jacob Wexler, our elections chief, and two of our uh, election staff who specialize in neighborhood council elections, who will be very glad to go through the survey point by point and answer any questions. Good afternoon. I'm Jacob Wexler with the uh, Office of the City Clerk Elections Division. Uh, let me just run through the, the key findings quickly, and then uh, we can open it up for, for any questions that you may have, more specific questions. So uh, some of the key points that we have responses on that we wanted to uh, discuss, uh, first of all, the issue of whether or not neighborhood councils were interested in having, were willing to have the elections postponed uh, the of, of the boards, 53 percent 
were opposed to postponing their, their elections in 2014, and the remaining 47 percent were willing to have those elections uh, postponed. Uh, in terms of the question of whether or not neighbor councils would be willing to pay for part or all of the elections in 2012, uh, of, of the uh, 53 percent who wanted to hold elections in 2012, uh, 76 percent, or you know, three quarters, were willing to contribute some amount to the summer or, or the full amount to the uh, to, to that, those elections that would occur this year. And that's only the folks that wanted to have them in 2012. That was not the overall. Uh, Correct. Right. <laughs> the question was just as a one. The question was only for those who were willing to, who wanted to have elections in 2012. We did not ask the question as a general matter. But again, let me just clarify. The 76 percent represents only those <laughs> part of the 50-some percent that said elections in 2012. Yes, that's correct. Uh, in terms of uh, who the neighborhood councils prefer to have administer their elections for them, about a third, 34 percent, uh, their first choice would be to have uh, independent election administrators run the election. <coughs> uh, about a quarter or 25 percent would prefer to have the their first choice would be to have the city clerk run the elections for them. Uh, 16 percent would prefer simply a, a selection process, which would be sort of a town hall type meeting in which uh, representatives, board members would be would be selected maybe through a show of hands or a voice vote. Uh, about 11 percent first choice would be to have uh, done run the elections for them, and the remaining were a combination or, or other, uh, you know, were spread amongst a variety of other options. Uh, finally, uh, in terms of the, the type of election the neighbor councils would like to have, uh, a full 90 percent of neighbor councils prefer to have uh, at polls elections, either exclusively at polls or at polls combined with other potential uh, methods such as vote by mail. Uh, on the other hand, only 6 percent of the neighbor councils stated that they would be interested in having uh, internet voting, uh, which is something we used to, we asked to, to look at. Uh, in terms of the choice between an election versus a selection, a selection process, which are the two options identified, I think, in the charter, 85% uh, prefer to have a, an election with, you know, the full secret ballot as opposed to 15% who would prefer the selection process, which would be an open voting process. So those are uh, some of the main points summarized, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. The, uh, I think that in going through, uh, and again, so to keep it in context, the numbers, although the percentages are high, some of these numbers are fairly small because we had a small group that responded. That's correct. We had about 63, 63 neighbor councils uh, participate in the survey. Uh, we uh, did. What's that? Two thirds or whatever. That's about two thirds of the total. So we did our, our best efforts and you know extending deadlines and and contacted every neighbor council directly on multiple occasions to try to get as, as much participation as possible. Uh, and that was the number that we had. And I think what would be helpful when we articulate that, that we give raw numbers along with the percentages so that we can say, uh, particularly when we're using percentages of percentages, 53% uh, of the 75% or whatever uh, yeah. says one thing, and that way we'd have a better sense. Uh, having read, uh, in fact, let me ask, is any other comments or about the survey? Well, in, in reference to, <clears throat> to the number of NCs that did respond, uh, my name is Isaias Kantu, I'm um, Senior Project Coordinator for the Election Division. Uh, we, we did perform a great deal of outreach and, um, to all the NCs, including reminder emails and phone banking to all presidents and treasurers at two months, at one month, at two weeks, at one week, and the day of, just to remind them to turn in the, the, the uh, document. On top of that, we also work with neighborhood councils that mentioned they would not be able to reach at the deadline uh, on extensions. So we did do a great deal of work to, to try to incorporate everyone's preferences uh, to compile the survey. Okay. I, I'd like to make sure on the committee report that we have that information as to the outreach that they performed and in the sense of, uh, uh, of the timeliness and also the extension of the time so that we get a sense that uh, you made every effort to get the 95 uh, 
neighborhood councils involved. What I'd like to do in using as best we can this survey, first of all, we'd like to, and I don't know what would be appropriate time, we'd like to look at a point in time in the future to do an additional survey that we can ask these questions or others that come to light at a future date and in there continue to look at as pilot programs that provide other options and also the vote by mail option, which were part of two motions that we received and filed earlier. And so we can ask, in fact, I'll ask you what would be an appropriate timeline to look at resurveying this particular subject. The staff in our division, of course, is going to get heavily involved with the municipal elections beginning in the summertime. Probably we can work together to find a good time, but I would imagine the sooner we start on that, the better it would be. But the thing is, I think the meaningfulness would be sometime before the 2014 elections. Closer to the 2014 elections? I would think that would be the most meaningful. Okay. Yes. Holly. Holly Walcott, Executive Officer, Office of the City Clerk. We'd probably have to go back and discuss a timeline. I don't think that's something we can answer off the cusp right here. But one of the things I did want to address regarding the vote by mail is what happened in the 2010 elections, and basically the vote by mail was just too expensive. It was a part of the original proposal, but mail and the preparation for the mail would have cost $500,000, and that was the first thing cut when the budget was cut was the vote by mail. So the reason we were required to ensure that everybody had the opportunity to vote and the people who could not vote because they were either for religious reasons or for health reasons, vote by mail was only extended to those people. But it wasn't a lack of ability or lack of wanting to do vote by mail. Same with outreach. It was a financial issue. Okay. But we'll have to get back to you on this. But I think if we add it to a future survey, we can keep looking at it. But at this time, I think particularly when we reference one of the earlier motions, that the cost of being costly is one of the reasons that it has not been implemented as of today. But we'll keep it alive in a future survey. But if you can look at the timing and so we can have that. And we'll report back to you. Or the committee report that says, and again, I don't know whether somewhere I would think prior to 2014 that we would have some form of a survey to go back and identify the issues that came out in the 2012 elections and what are the items of most concern for 2014. So we can figure that. The other thing that we'd ask that looking at the election cycle, that our goal is to have elections prior to the end of 2012 for neighborhood councils, that also in looking at one of the recommendations that we look at independent election administrators that working in conjunction with Dunn for 2012, as this ordinance only moves the responsibility for one year, and then independent election administrators with the city clerk in future years. And so also I'd ask the CLA and the CAO to look at what would be an appropriate dollar amount that as we move forward for the 2012 elections, that we could basically ask the neighborhood councils to provide to assist in these elections so that we know that the city's budget is not going to be able to fund those, but what would be appropriate being that a significant number of those who wanted elections in 2012 said that they'd be willing to contribute limited funds, and in fact a smaller amount said even cover the full election. So we need to come up with a figure that would be appropriate for each neighborhood council to contribute to basically reduce the cost and burden on the city. The other issue is on the preference of elections, clearly overwhelmingly at poll elections, but those who wish to do a selection or town hall mode would be within their discretion. And so I think those cover the major points in the report, but again we'll forward those to council as 
uh, policy st uh, statements and implementations for the 2012 election, and it should go hand in hand with the ordinance uh, uh, for number four. Quick question for clarification. You mentioned earlier that you wanted to deal with the 2010 audit. And that would be when we come back at another meeting, next okay. meeting when we're dealing with finances. Okay. Because our goal, once we hopefully move elections passed, we'll be coming back with financing and funding uh, issues as a group. Okay. Any other questions? Do you need anything else, Mr. Clerk? No, sir. Your final action on number four would be to note and file the city clerk report with traditional instructions for the various report packs you requested. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.